Here we go. The Talent Development uh, Usage and Attitude Audit, our first one. We hope that uh, we will be able to do this on a regular basis uh, in order to really build a longitudinal uh, study and learning and best practices for all of us. We fielded it in uh, October. And as I said, this is truly the top line. We've really uh, put in the midnight uh, hours to uh, pull some meaningful findings from this data, even though it literally just, just landed um, on my desk. So by the end of November, we will have a full uh, report um, and sort of a, a, a white paper to augment what uh, you'll be receiving today as a top line. So um, let me do the executive uh, summary version of what we took away from our first audit. Um, just so that we start with the elevator pitch and then do the deep dive into things. The headlines are these. It's an interesting story. It starts with an understanding that we all really do see the value. We recognize the value and the importance of the idea of talent development. The idea of talent development. And that management, for the most part, is very supportive of the idea. The issue is in the practice of it. And the practice of talent development and the challenges of, of, of staying uh, and building and, and managing a great practice come at all levels of the organization. It comes at the, the leadership level, the people in this room, uh, the time and the resources that it takes to actually create um, a strong strategy and practice. And for the most part, there seem to be two key gaps that we uh, would like to propose to you and put out as a hypothesis today, that if these two key gaps were actually addressed, that we would go a long way to mitigating the challenges of uh, building a, a more effective practice. And the two gaps are these. The first is recognizing that any planning cycle in talent development needs to start with a consistently articulated talent development strategy. And we'll be talking about what is a talent development strategy and how might one actually build one and create a consistent one and not get too bogged down by it. Because of course, that's the tension of talking strategy is you kind of want to stay agile at the same time that you have a plan. The other gap, interestingly, is on the back end of the cycle where we see a gap in being deliberate about measurement of the practice to gauge the organizational impact of the talent development initiatives you put in place. So it's that classic front end, back end conundrum, you know? Having a strategy and a plan that's consistent and, and articulated and aligned across the management group and on the back end actually measuring it to see how you did. Sounds simple really tough in practice, actually. Yeah? So that's the kind of headline story. Now let's get into it in a bit more context. So here's some housekeeping on what the study was actually built on. A few things to bear in mind. This is a study that is a quantitative study, and it was um, delivered by ICA, focused specifically on talent development, only within the ICA membership, including our CAPMA partners. So approximately 79 agencies were invited to participate in the study across the total ICA membership uh, Canada-wide. The term talent development we defined as being uh, um, a, a term to signify the formal organizational efforts on developing employees' skills and attitudes and performance. And we shared that with everyone who filled and completed the, the study. So we all kind of had a fundamental starting point of what does talent development mean? It's the organization's approach to building the skills, the attitudes, and the performance of its employees. The study was fielded in October. And as I mentioned, we intend to keep it, uh, create a longitudinal look so that we can actually build best practices and benchmarking over time for all of our members, which we think will be a really valuable thing. Um, here are some of the hardcore facts. There was a 57% response rate, which I've been told is quite good. <laughs> um, 
So we had a, a total population of 45 complete the, uh, the, the, the prime study um, with a good representative spread of all agency sizes. So about 20% from agencies, for the smaller agencies of less than 25 employees, 44% from 25 to 75 employees, and then an even split between the next two sizes up. Another important piece of information, who were the people who completed this survey? Well, nice to see approximately half of the respondents uh, see themselves consider or, or, or view themselves as holding a position on the management team. And within that, uh, for the total study, uh, a significant majority uh, viewed themselves as being in the human resources uh, uh, department or having a human resources capacity. That's how they self-described themselves. So that's a nice senior, senior uh, focus as well as a discipline focus that's relevant to the conversation. And then uh, finally, I, I mentioned that uh, we had a 57% response rate. That was on the initial, what we call the short form survey. We did invite people to stay with us and complete a, a deeper inquiry, another quantitative deeper inquiry. And it was nice to see that we actually got a pretty good hold on the longer form. So we had uh, a 44% of respondents continued on to do the deeper inquiry. So we had a sample size of 20 for the longer form, which again is not a bad number for a deeper inquiry. So that's housekeeping. Some general top lines. So here we go. Now we're getting into kind of the, the meat of all of the stories that we picked up. An interesting story around valuing soft skills. And in particular, soft skills that can be directly tied to better work outcomes. The soft skills that we most value are in the area of relationship management, team building, and creative innovation skills. One of the things that was interesting is uh, that people are saying that they're very uh, keen in the future to build skills in the area of idea development as sort of an area of important skill focus for their, for their team. We reward our top performers as a group. 83% of the respondents uh, augment talent development for top performers, and in particular in ways such as mentoring and coaching and indiv individualized training plans. Talent development is often bottom up. You're going to hear this story a few times uh, over the next few minutes. 78% of respondents follow the lead of their employees. Individual training starts with employee requests more than any other source. Self-directed learning. We'll talk about that. Joint talent development initiatives are only marginally on the radar. Less than 20% of agencies actually uh, currently do joint training with their clients. We think this is an interesting area that we were, are very uh, uh, keen on tracking over time because we think that over time, we may see an increase in that area. We seem to notice that our clients are wanting more training in the areas that we ourselves want to train in. And the question becomes, what better way to become collaborative than to train with your client as opposed to at your client? Um, so we think we might see some growth there, and we'll start to, to track that. And then um, a very important um, program that the ICA uh, focuses a lot of time and attention on the CAP program. Good news there also is that it's viewed as valuable by those who use it. 88% of those who enroll employees in CAP see it as an important or very important part of their practice approach. Um, the strongest depth of usage, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, is in the mid-sized to large agencies, 50%. So one in every two agencies of that size use CAP or have used CAP uh, as part of their practice approach. Um, and interestingly, uh, but perhaps explainable, uh, despite a directionally higher level of uh, investment, smaller agencies don't seem to be using CAP that much. So we'll, we'll do some investigation of why that is as well. So that's the top line. Now I'd like to spend a little bit of time giving you some support and understanding of why the headlines were what they were. So let's start 
with a, a couple of themes. The first theme is about you. Does this sentence look like it might be about you? Yeah. <laughs> Much responsibility, little time. This is about you. Nearly two-thirds of respondents see themselves as holding important roles as either creators or contributors to the talent development strategies that they manage for their companies. However, most spend less than 20% of their total time in planning and implementing anything to do with talent development. And even deeper into that world of isn't this interesting, nearly half of all respondents spend less than 10% of their time dedicated to talent development focused activities. So a large majority consider themselves creators and contributors to talent development and a large majority really has very little time to put against it. Thus the title. Another interesting observation about commitment inside of your organizations, and it's possibly a good news story, stable investment, clear motivation. Let's talk about this a little bit. Some interesting um, findings on investment levels. Companies are investing an average of between $200 and $500 per person, about 47% of respondents are, av are, are averagely spending that amount. Uh, what becomes interesting is when you start breaking it down by size of agency, and you'll have uh, this information in your, in your takeaways. I, I've spoken to this quickly before, but just to spend a bit more time on it, directionally small agencies are spending more relative to larger agencies. 44% of small agencies spend in excess of $500 per full-time employee versus 26% of all agencies, perhaps explainable by virtue of uh, it being a smaller, likely more senior group, therefore the cost to uh, build, and skill, build skills or send them on leadership uh, development, chances are that's a more expensive investment for a smaller group of people. One of the things that I found particularly curious about uh, investments was the mid-size agencies, the 26 to 75 employee level, where um, there's a significant underspend. 31% of uh, those uh, agencies spend less than $200 per person per year on training. Um, there also seems to be something wonky at the high end on the 25 to 75 sample. So, you know, we haven't scrubbed the data yet, but uh, Certainly the, 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 the large percentage of under $200 level of spending was a, was a curiosity for us for that uh, particular group. Um, and, and no particular surprise on the orientation uh, uh, to um, a solid amount of investment per person for the larger agencies. Okay, so there's just some nice breakdowns. A few deeper dives, 63% of the total average spend is focused on client-facing employees. And we're also spending on keeping uh, employees above average. 44% of the spending is to enhance performance as opposed to uh, mitigate gaps in skills um, and help people fill those gaps. So a good, so stable investment um, kind of story. Among uh, those increasing or stabilizing their budgets, of which 82% indicated they were holding or increasing their budgets, which uh, I found to be an encouraging number in these tough economic times, there's a desire to invest in the human side. Leveraging talent development opportunities as a means to attract and retain the best employees. And we found this not only through the anecdotal commentary that we got in the uh, in the explanation of why, you know, please comment on why you see your budgets moving in the direction that they're moving in. So anecdotally, there was evidence that the human side is, is becoming very important for people. And also, we uh, corroborated that uh, anecdotal evidence with another question, which was, well, what uh, areas of soft skills are you investing in? and notably culture and organizational development skills. So helping people at the leadership or emerging leadership level be better at influencing culture 
inside of uh, uh, their organizations was ranked uh, very high relative to others that you might predict would, would get the highest skills, so scores. So relationship skills, creativity and innovation, and team building rank the highest of, of the soft skills that are, are being trained, and culture and OD training next, next after those three. So kind of an interesting finding. Those with declining uh, development investment, which was 18% of respondents, cite budget-related issues, shrinking margins, and tough economic times. No surprise there. We continue. So here's some interesting backup to the headline I shared with you about um, talent development strategies and the, and the challenges in the practice. Many don't have a formal uh, talent development strategy. Despite the fact that investment in talent development is happening, it does not appear to a great extent to be built on any kind of formalized strategy. Nearly half of the sample don't have a formalized strategy. And about a third indicate that while they do have a strategy, they really just use it as a guideline. No one in the study indicated that they had a talent development strategy that they consistently followed. Zero percent. So, welcome to the club. Yay! <laughs> we should all feel good about that. We're in good company. Um, for many, and this is the interesting part of the tension, not having a strategy is a significant source of dissatisfaction. The lack of a formal strategy was one of the top mentions when asked about which parts of their overall talent development practice they were the least satisfied with. So we recognize that there's some gaps there that need to be filled. Many don't measure the impact. This was the other part of our, our headline to you. For most, the investment in talent development is not being measured in terms of its organizational impact. Among those who did measure the impact, the primary mechanisms were employee generated, which kind of makes sense because if 71% or 78% of respondents actually get their employees to tell them where they want to go and get their skills built, you know, if it's all employee generated, then why wouldn't the measurement be employee generated as well, right? It, it just seems to be kind of, well, give them what they want and they'll be happy. Okay. Um, this employee-centric thinking may be of critical importance. It's not to say that it's wrong. It's just to recognize and to get mindful about why we do it and what its importance is. Um, being employee-centric is absolutely, to build on Carolyn's uh, um, conversation, uh, is seen as incredibly important. In the uh, deeper inquiry with the sample size of 20, 90% of respondents indicated that they saw um, engagement as being a very, very important measure uh, of uh, an indicator of organizational performance. So, you know, it may not be an accident that we are so employee-centric. We may, as Carolyn rightly pointed out, intuitively get that having engaged employees makes sense. And we may believe that having them self-direct their own development is a key part of engagement. I don't know if we know that for a fact, that there's a direct correlation between having them make their own decisions about how they're going to be uh, trained and uh, engagement. I think it's worthy of further conversation and investigation. Um, but it's a, good, it's a good observation to have and to ask questions about it. Is there a direct correlation between self-determination in terms of skill building and engagement? So here are some best practices and opportunities. Among those with some form of guidelines for talent development, respondents were most satisfied with these particular approaches. Plans that mapped to company values and philosophy, very important to tie plans to culture. And those plans that allowed for creators to individualize or, or be nimble, as, as the words go, in capitalizing on opportunistic needs. And this goes back to that whole kind of natural human fear we have around, does a strategy hold me down or does a strategy hold me up? 
and you know, the proof's in the pudding, which way it goes, right? Uh, but the need to be nimble, absolutely uh, a key part of uh, you know, working in our industry in particular. And then having some form of talent management review that contributed to the strategy. So really sharing the, um, uh, the, the authority and the, the accountability with uh, management to review and to be part of the strategy as opposed to it being top down. Much more middle up and perhaps even bottom up. There's a recognized need for a standardized form of measurement on the impact of talent development, an ROI measure. And uh, if there's you know, ways that, and means that ICA can help to figure out how we might create some standardization, much like uh, the wonderful standards that Carolyn demonstrated for us in terms of world-class organizations and average organizations, you know, I think that those are the kinds of things that ICA can, uh, can contribute to this, to this conversation. Um, the other main pain point, having said this already, is uh, a general lack of prioritization on talent development in general, caused by the fact that the fires in the day-to-day -day take away from any kind of intention that relates to long-term commitments. It's a fact of our industry. And one might ask the question, so how might a strategy help you in those tough times? You know, stand in a place where the headwinds are so strong um, that at least you are more conscious about the decisions that you're making, good or bad, for the organization. How might we leverage the positive management climate that there appears to be for the idea of talent development to help support a more rigorous and uh, deeper commitment to the practice of it, as opposed to just the idea, taking it right to the ground and moving it from idea to practice. Yeah? And the good news is, is we do have a positive outlook on it. It's not like we're necessarily pushing water uphill, although there will probably be days where it feels like that. Um, how to empower you all as talent development leaders to consistently dedicate the time and resources needed to maintain a practice. I mean, it's a truth that you do so much more than this in your job, and the data backs that up. And on some levels, just getting conscious about that is probably a good thing, that everybody else is in the same position, relatively speaking. And so the question becomes one of, in the time that I have, how might I do my best? And that's a question that we all have to ask in all of our jobs, right? So uh, a, a sense of empowerment, I think, is something that we can uh, help to foster and to promote by being in community. Examining uh, industry-wide standards, the possibility of creating some industry-wide standards. And I think that that could be a really interesting role for ICA to play, as long as Janny backs me up on that. Um, you know, creating some best practice guidelines to give membership, in particular membership, because we're all about giving value to our members. And the idea that we do something that helps the industry, and by virtue of helping the industry, by association helping your enterprise is what this is all about. And then finally, um, the beloved CAP, you know, uh, it's my job to continue to promote and make the case for the value of CAP as a core performance enhancement tool. And now we've got some really great data to back it up. The people who use CAP strongly validate the value of CAP. And frankly, if I could just, you know, of all the people in this room, half of you probably haven't used CAP. If I could just talk to you privately about what we're doing in CAP, I suspect that uh, I wouldn't have any problem getting my next class of CAP students in because it's literally that easy once you have great data, which is what we do. So with that said, I am on time, which is great.